Oh, oh, yeah, that does sound better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Come in and take your seats. We're about to start the breakout summaries. But before I do that, um, I know there's been some confusion about shuttles to the airport. So if Aaron Carlson booked your travel, you do have a shuttle. The general plan is that you are in the lobby three hours before your flight, and then someone will come into the lobby and retrieve the people for the shuttle. In the Slack channel, PCW announcements, um, I got the, a PDF of the shuttle manifest from Aaron. So if you still are unsure, you should be able to check that PDF and see the times of the shuttles. And if you have one scheduled, it should be in there. If your travel was not booked by Aaron Carlson and you're looking for a way to the airport, I've heard that some of the shuttles will have extra space. So you're welcome to, as long as you leave a lot of time, loiter in the lobby and try to get on one of those shuttles. And then as a backup, I think you can always call for a taxi. So if you have any more questions about that, I guess try in PCW announce, just like respond in the thread there and we'll try to help you out. And that's it, that's the only announcement. So we're gonna get started with our breakout summaries. Um, if you're new to the PCW, the breakout summaries is always the last plenary of the week. There is one slide per breakout session. They are organized by day. So we will see a slide like this uh, for Monday. There will be one for each day of the week. If you are, if you were a session chair or if you're speaking to one of the slides that has been created, and you're speaking to one of them on the Monday, then I would ask you to come and just loiter over here on the side. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's, it's you and it's me and it's Kevin. Yes. Yeah, just come and loiter here so that you're ready to speak to your slide. Good, we're getting everybody. And so what's gonna happen, you'll see us do it, is I will advance to the next slide. Whoever it slide that is will come up, speak to it. They will advance to the next one. That person will come up, speak to it. When we reach the next day, we will pause again to allow all the speakers for the next day to come up and do it over and over. Okay, you've been instructed. Michael, you are first. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Michael Strauss. I'm representing the Science Advisory Committee. Uh, we covered a broad range of topics in our uh, discussion on Monday morning. I've listed them all. One of the, th the themes that came up in the morning were thing we were going to be talking about all these things throughout the week, and indeed we were. So a variety of the topics that you'll see listed here have been uh, also the subject of discussion in some detail uh, as we go fo forward. The SAC is preparing uh, responses, questions, and recommendations for the project and operations leadership and the other uh, discussion that we had Briefly was the meta discussion of what is the future of the SAC itself. It will continue in a perhaps somewhat modified form into operations. We're in the process of preparing a charter for that. I'll finish there. Uh, I'm Kevin Real. I'm the observatory scientist down in Chile. We had a session on traveling to Chile with a focus really on people that are doing it for the first time or relatively new. Um, La Serena is wonderful. You should come if you have the opportunity. Um, but noting that it was a it's a foreign country, and so tips and trips tips and tricks are sometimes helpful. And then, as I did on Monday, uh, a quick shout out to the uh, team in Chile who have been working all week while we were here at the Ritz Carlton. Um, here is the uh, camera mass surrogate on level eight with the with the roof of the dome lifted off, uh, ready to be installed on the telescope next week. So, thank you. We took the opportunity to have an all hands meeting for the data management team. We heard updates from all the different subgroups, including from Christian on the long haul network, which the Chile portion to date has been shot, cut, stolen. We also celebrated the completion of the Gen 3 Butler, which has been adopted by the NASA SphereX mission. And you may not realize, but we are switching data facilities from NCSA to Slack this week. And there have been a lot of people really hard at work behind the scenes, furiously trying to get the USDF ready for us. So thank you, Richard, KT, and friends. Okay. 
Uh, always on the first day of the conference, now we do an intro to Ruben that focuses on the systems and especially on the jargon and acronyms. So we go through all the different Ruben systems and really try to hammer on all the terms that our new people will be hearing over the following week. And we had uh, a lot of presenters in this session to cover all the different things like communications, telescope and sight, camera, all of that stuff is all covered. I've put a list here of nice resources for you if you are new to Rubin and maybe you missed this session or you've already forgotten because that was five days ago. So all of those are here. We also had the fun poll. We always try to do something like an icebreaker or something fun in the intro to Rubin session. And this year was a little bit harder. So Fed and I made this fun poll, which is still open. And I was gonna post results during this session, but now that's gonna be impossible. But I'll make a nice little summary of the fun poll results. So you still have time to do it if you haven't done it yet um, at this URL here. And I'll um, post them, not by lunch, but later, but later today. Okay, Tuesday speakers. Come and line up. And the we did try to put the slides sort of in order of how things went in the day, but since it's impossible to order up by slide, after you speak, advance the slide so then the person can see the slide that's next. Bellum, you're up first. Hi everyone, Michael Wibbezi and I uh, organized a session on difference image analysis. Uh, looking at uh, both project plans and some really nice uh, work from community members using the Rubin pipelines and difference imaging. Uh, and we talked about uh, uh, future plans for uh, activities during commissioning uh, and the challenges of uh, template building. Thanks. Hello, I'm Rachel Street speaking on behalf of Tony Tyson, who organized the session on LeoSat constellations and their impact on Rubin. Uh, LeoSats will have a variety of signatures in Rubin data. They will cause the extremely bright, um, saturated streaks that you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, but those streaks are time variable. They're also flux variable. Um, and they cause both stri uh, streaks and glints that are absolutely brilliant, third magnitude, and they vary by three and a half magnitudes. We covered the um, impacts that this has on the LSST CAM data, uh, which suffers obviously saturation, but also crosstalk. That signature is nonlinear and extremely hard to remove. We did discuss several mitigation efforts that are currently under the way in the astronomical community, um, notably uh, by the IAU's new Center for Dark and Quiet Skies, and also um, uh, Meredith Roll's efforts in the Trailblazer platform, among others. We acknowledged um, that some of the LeoSat operators are doing a great job of engaging with us, uh, most notably SpaceX. Um, and they have put in a number of hardware mitigations. They're exploring more. But many more LeoSat operators have not yet engaged. And uh, during this meeting, we actually heard about a new uh, planned constellation which has been proposed, which would be uh, have enormous satellites with over 100 square meters of white reflective paneling at an altitude of um, 400 kilometers. Uh, those would completely saturate uh, LSST CAM. So clearly this is an area where we have a lot more work to do. Thank you. So uh, on Tuesday after, um, Tuesday morning, I led an equity and inclusion workshop and I took all the participants whom I divided into groups through essentially an organizational evaluation of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, there was a lot of discussion um, reviewing the different spaces in which DE&I has impact, such as leadership, organizational planning, resource allocation, and accountability. And what I found, uh, what the groups reported out, was most felt like their either science collaboration or organization was between a two and a three, meaning that there's a growing awareness that bias exists and 
there is some notice of organizational change through special programs and leadership. But all of that indicated was that there was work to be done. And what I hope to gain from this workshop is to give people specific things to think about in the context of DEI and how to make the most effective changes. Thanks. It's Blake here. Okay, I'm going to count to 15 so you can read the slide. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm not Keith Bechtel. Um, Keith had to get an early shuttle home, so he asked me to present his slide. On Tuesday morning, Keith led a session on science verification and validation. The session was focused on discussing the strategy for how to evaluate the scientific performance of the as-built Reuven Observatory System using calibration and on-sky observations from both ComCam and LSSTCAM. There was a strong focus on, on many uh, aspects, uh, for example, what are the deliverables, what sort of tooling will we use, uh, how does this relate to the construction and data delivery milestones, how do we use the on-sky observations during commissioning, uh, what's the role of OrgsTel as a, as a survey pathfinder, uh, how do we do QA, what are the timescales, and then how do we organize this very big effort. This is an activity that is uh, starting to ramp up now. It's going to grow quite rapidly over the next two years and will become a very dominant activity at the observatory. It includes uh, expertise from across the whole project, uh, including the data management science pipelines and VNV teams, also from the ops VNV teams, systems engineering, all the subsystems, as well as in-kind contributions. Uh, one of the big topics is how do we bring the in-kind contributions in to work with the observatory on this topic. There is a proposal to organize the effort around a set of science units. Um, these are themes or topics uh, to carry out science verification validation on. Uh, the groups would be responsible for reporting the characterization of the data quality to inform commissioning and to also help with science pipelines development and the overall verification effort. Um, so I'm going to continue to channel Keith Bechtel in his second session. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Leanne Guy, the data management scientist. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so we have about roughly 30 groups from the U.S. and Chile plus international uh, that make up about 100 individuals in total who, are, who have proposed in-kind contributions to the commissioning effort. We're currently working uh, through the process of onboarding all of these people, creating accounts, defining initial work assignments. And so this session was focused, uh, was really hands-on, focused on getting these people onboarded, getting them working, getting their accounts up. And um, it was also a chance for people to meet each other. There were, um, you know, introductions. A lot of these people met each other for the first time. They'd never worked together before or seen each other before. Uh, the session concluded with um, a tutorial notebook, running through a tutorial anal notebook that demonstrated how to use the analysis tools Python package for doing verification, computing metrics, and generating plots. Thank you. Stop. I'll stop telling people. This Aaron Watkins. I'm representing the Low Surface Brightness Working Group. We had a very productive two LSB sessions. I'll attempt to briefly summarize. Uh, basically, LSST is a great opportunity because it should be at the survey that for the very first time obtains statistically robust samples of things like dwarf galaxies, many of which were completely invisible in past large surveys, tidal streams, intercluster light, as well as its fainter and far less well-studied cousin intergroup light. Uh, and th even things like galaxy truncations. Um, there was also, it was brought up that high redshift galaxies, things that we might expect to see in the LSSD gold sample, are low surface brightness objects as well. So there's a lot of cross-pollination between, uh, for example, lensing and low surface brightness science and the use of ICL as a cosmological probe. Uh, but this all hinges on the, ex on the uh, data reduction procedure because LSB flux is extremely sensitive to things like scattered light, uh, the sky subtraction algorithm used, and even small effects like offsets in the flux from the CCD amplifiers. 
So lots of novel techniques are currently being investigated and actively developed in order to ensure that LSB flux is preserved in LSST images. And the good news is it seems like what will work for LSB science in terms of data reduction will work for a lot of other science aspects as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Bellum, Outlaw Production Science Lead. Uh, we had a session on the exciting and technically challenging opportunities uh, for multi-messenger TOOs uh, with Ruben Observatory. Uh, Ruben has a unique and exciting capability to potentially discover uh, um, uh, optical counterparts to gravitational wave sources in particular, as well as uh, other potential sources of TOOs. Uh, one challenge is that the forthcoming LIGO Virgo, LIGO Virgo Cagra uh, observing run 04 is only slightly overlapping with this, the uh, sort of early stages of Rubin commissioning, which is well prior to uh, alert production uh, running uh, at scale. And so we discussed potential ways to uh, still enable some science and to test out Rubin's TOO capabilities uh, during this time. Thanks. Uh, so Sandrine Thomas, uh, Deputy Director for Construction and Telescope and the Scientist. In this session, we discussed trust. Uh, we, I'm going to start by saying that we have a monthly topical discussion about diversity and inclusion topics, as well as workplace culture. And uh, this is on uh, Mondays once a month. So if you are interested, please either watch out for the inclusion channel or uh, talk to me or Rampal uh, for information. And one of the topics that we discussed uh, those months was uh, about trust, how to build or rebuild trust in, in a workplace. And so the, the, the message was that we need to focus on three axes, empathy, logic, and authenticity. And so during that session, we first listened to the video that I put a link to in the slide, and we also discussed and then add a little bit of an activity on, on trusting each other. Uh, so some comments that I want to highlight are that it is uh, this uh, strategy uh, can be applicable to everyone in the workplace, leadership or not. Um, we agreed that logic is very easy and that we need to really work on how we uh, communicate that logic, but also how we become more empathetic and uh, authentic. Uh, so that was a great session, I thought, and uh, I leave you with a message of make sure you celebrate differences, and also if you have any suggestions on this session or anything that we can do in the future, please, I put a, a link here um, for you to send us uh, ideas, or just reach out to me directly. Thank you. So I'm not Chris Walter, though I do play him on TV occasionally. Um, so I'm Andy Connolly. I'm presenting on the IMSIM session at the PCW. So IMSIM is a software framework for simulating uh, Rubin images. The session itself focuses on an enhancement to IMSIM, which is based on a package called Batoid. And this allows us to do ray tracing simulations, and that allows us to actually begin to simulate the out-of-focus images um, in the wavefront sensors. And so now that um, we'll be able to simulate both in-focus and out-of-focus images at the same time. So the majority of the work and the discussion at this session were what were the needs for the AOS, the active optic systems, um, what were the needs from the, in terms of developing the software for actually processing those out of focus images and how can IMSIM be used? And the goal is to get this functionality in place by the end of, um, by the end of the calendar year. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Galliano. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois and I co-chaired the Elastic session with Alex Maltz. Ex Elastic stands for the Extended LSST Astronomical Time Series Classification Challenge. It's an extension of a similar challenge that was run in 2019 called Plastic. And the main goal of Elastic is to stress test our broker's abilities to ingest LSST-like alerts in real time and translate those alerts to meaningful information about the time domain sky. 
So this is a massive simulation effort that involves multiple parties, and we really wanted to get everybody into the room to identify any remaining gaps within this uh, simulation framework before we move to sending out the full test stream starting September of this year. So we started hearing from uh, Rick Kessler about the underlying transient models for the simulations. Then we heard from Melissa Graham, who gave us a little bit of an overview. She mentioned a lot of different lingo associated with objects uh, in the catalog. And then we heard from Anais Moeller on behalf of the Fink broker system. There are some alerts that have already been uh, streamed out, and so Anais gave us a little bit of a perspective on how the Fink broker is currently ingesting and processing that information. And I think the two main kind of most salient points to arise out of that conversation, the first one is that it's a classification challenge first and foremost, but especially with a rolling cadence, the light curves can look dramatically different for different types of transients. And so should there be a ranked hierarchy for classifying some transients over others, and to what extent will classification actually translate to meaningful science on the side of the users is still kind of an open question. And also playing off of that, it seemed that uh, there's a steep learning curve to working with brokers uh, for users to do science, and uh, it seems like it would be wonderful if there was more engagement from actual science groups working with, um, with this data set. And so we're hoping to increase our community engagement. We're still trying to figure out the right way to do that. Maybe that's a series of science hacks with the broker teams. Maybe that's a talk series. We're still iterating on what the right solution is. But if you're interested or have any ideas for how to do this, then please come talk to me. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Blum. I'm the operations director. Uh, let me just take the, a quick moment uh, with my operations director hat on and say thank you so much for, for an amazing meeting. Uh, the operations team came here. Uh, we presented a lot of things in different that connected to operations in different uh, sessions in the plenaries, privately with you in the hallways. Uh, we talked about uh, many things that we haven't been getting quite right or that we were not talking about um, on the same level with you. We got lots of good feedback about things that we need to do better. And we're going to continue to work with you to make sure that as we go forward, we are delivering the kind of operations plan um, that uh, is going to be successful for you to do your science uh, in the future when we're actually uh, have real data flowing. So thanks for all the feedback. Keep it coming. Always my door is open. Uh, contact me anytime. I'm just going to briefly say a few words about early science, which, one, which was one of the big uh, topics that we talked about uh, in many venues uh, this week. Uh, thank you to Leanne Guy for leading this session and putting it together, and to Phil Marshall, who contributed a lot of good thoughts behind the scenes. So we are trying to build a framework that actually addresses some of the uncertainty as we go forward about where we'll be when we go into operations with the finish of the, of the project. Our, our goal is to give you enough information that you can plan successfully so that, that it actually reduces the uncertainty in, what, in, in how you will um, be getting the data that you want as we roll into operations. Uh, the survey start, the wide, fast, deep, uh, may occur some months after um, after the actual start of operations, but we will be working with you on what that looks like. We are developing this framework in this document, RTN011, so take a look at that as we go forward. It's a living document. It's pretty, um, uh, well, we have a lot of work to do, so, so check in uh, periodically as we go forward on that. In any case, there will be a data preview before we roll into data uh, release one, and we'll try and get that to you as early as possible uh, when the survey starts. Um, and, you know, maybe this is one of those things that was obvious to us, but it wasn't obvious to all of you, and so it's great to be here to talk to you in person. As soon as we're taking data in operations, the nightly data that we are taking that is useful to you to have will be available right away on the shortest time scale that's planned in for operations, currently the 80-hour time scale. So you will be getting data as soon as we're taking it. You won't have to wait for a data preview to see 
of what we're doing on the sky as we roll into operations. We do have some serious work with the SCOC, the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee, uh, left to do to, to actually identify the strategies for how we do uh, some of the work early on in year one, like wh where we're covering the sky, uh, trading off more filters versus less sky or more sky versus less filters, that kind of thing. And we will continue to fold that into our planning as we go forward. Uh, and we will continue to have more and more detailed discussions with you on community.org. So keep checking that out. Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning. My name is Giovanni Corbeto, Safety, Health, uh, and Environment Manager. Um, on, during our session on Tuesday afternoon, along with Maria Fernanda Parra, Safety Coordinator, and Sergio Vega, Safety Coordinator as well, we discussed about how we want to continue to enhance our best practice in safety management during the commissioning and also during operation at the, at the project. Um, we are uh, involved and empowered to bring our safety culture into commissioning and operation. And during our session, we, uh, through some samples of uh, safety tools, we show how we want to do it that, how we will not continue the enhancement of the safety culture. Uh, at the end of the session, we uh, also uh, do the, uh, recognize the uh, former safety, head of safety and safety manager, Chuck Gessner, because he's already retired. And uh, on behalf of the safety team, we uh, give him uh, thanks for all the effort and for all the support during the years. Um, but uh, more important than that was a very good discussion. And um, we all uh, feel that uh, we are in a good path, especially because uh, our manpower, both here and in Chile, uh, are very committed with safety. And that is the reason of our successful uh, through the safety and environment during this year, and it's something that we want to continue uh, in commissioning and operation. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I'm Thiago Ribeiro from uh, Telescope Insight and Scheduler Scientist and Software Architect. Uh, during this session, we did a quick overview on the observatory control system or Rubin Observatory, uh, looking a little bit behind the curtains of how the observations are conducted at the summit with the summit crew. Uh, we did spoke a little bit about LOVE. It's the LSST operation visualization environment. Uh, there's some screenshots here of the uh, views we have of the system. And we did talk about uh, how to execute operations at the summit for uh, commissioning observations, uh, Oxtel, and how we plan to do that for the main telescope. And we also have doc plenty of documentation. There's a lot more to come, but we have some already that are available for uh, people to look at and see how to do stuff at the summit. And I link that in my session uh, slides in here again as a reference for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Wednesday, Wednesday speakers. Hello. On Wednesday, we had an update from Science Pipelines. The Science Pipelines are the software from data management that takes raw pixels coming off the telescope and produces processed images and catalogs. We're committed to providing state-of-the-art algorithms for science and making it possible to use our data products for science and higher-level pipelines. We gave an update on where we've been, where we are, and where we are going. Some new features. Think of it as a scientific release notes. We then went through some select topics from the algorithms workshop, including updates on astrometric calibration, deblending, image differencing, real bogus classification, and solar system object linking. We then had a panel discussion with the whole science pipelines team, at least the ones that were not otherwise occupied with the active optics session or the Oxtel session at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, hi. 
Uh, I'm Knut Olson. I'm going to try to simulate Lynn Jones, who is herself simulating the the simulations that, <laughs> that, that we are using um, as the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee uh, to recommend an observing strategy for uh, Ruben Ellis's T. Um, uh, so, so Lynn and Federica ran this um, ran this session uh, on behalf of the SCOC, and we are preparing to submit recommendation for the year one and 10 year plan by the end of this year, which will include um, a community workshop in November uh, to get feedback on that, that uh, recommendation. Um, so as the SCOC, we have been discussing um, uh, eight survey strategy questions and some highlights here. So one is that uh, we've come up with a modified footprint uh, recommendation you see there in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. Uh, so, so that that map should be sort of burned into your mind as the the, the map that you think of when you think of LSST, although it's likely to be modified somewhat, um, and particularly in the galactic plane. Um, we're also recommending uh, that uh, some rolling cadence, right, where you concentrate visits in some bands of the sky um, uh, to increase the the, um, uh, the fast cadence there needs to be part of the survey. Um, there's going to be some modification of the short time scale cadence so that we we can uh, not have large gaps in the in the um, power spectrum of time coverage. Um, been thinking about microsurveys, and particularly a twilight neo microsurvey seems to be quite valuable. We know that the deep drilling fields are valuable, and we need to incorporate uh, targets of opportunity. Um, we're still working on several of the questions, um, and so uh, look forward to that uh, workshop in November, an announcement of a new baseline sort of survey uh, recommendation before that. Thank you. I am also not Lynn Jones, but I'll present um, the, the great work that, uh, that Lynn led in the uh, Opsum and Math drop-in session. So this was a very small informal session where uh, we covered a lot of concerns that the attendees had about how to use math, um, how to, which, uh, which uh, metrics are included, uh, what does the scheduler do, what does math do, and also how to write new metrics. Um, the an interesting thing I think for this entire audience is that there are excellent notebooks and tutorials on metric writing, including a very very nice notebook that uh, literally has everything you need to to know and to write to to write your own metric with a cell that says uh, write your scientific metric code here. So I do really encourage you to to go to this uh, ls.st slash metric notebook metric workbook link um, to to go and check that out. Um, near the end of that session, we had. Uh, uh, discussions of more tutorials and examples, and then a discussion on how to um, interpret, I would say, and extend this this metric that's important for discovering unknown unknowns, where we're trying to see um, what are the, the time scales that LSST will be sensitive to, time scales of variability that LSST will be sensitive to, and especially time scales that it would not be sensitive to, and then how to improve that. So if you're, uh, if you're interested in results from this session and the various notebooks there, they're all here in the link in the slide. Thank you. Merlin fisher levine from Data Management, Calibration, and Commissioning. Um, I ran two sessions. Um, the first was an introductory session, mostly for the community, for an introduction to Orxtel. We heard what the Orxtel is, how it works, um, why it exists. We saw the first ever co-ed made with real LSSD hardware and software. There was about 2,000 pointings that went into the co-ed covering three bands, um, what is called the milli kilodegree imaging survey, um, so covering about one square degree of the sky, um, which is letting us test all of our pipelines with a real LSST chip. Um, we heard about the scheduler, and we learned about some early commissioning and teething problems on the summit. Um, the second session was a working session between uh, the camera team, members of the Sensor Anomalies Working Group in Desk and DM, we all sat down together, we talked about what the biggest concerns were about operating the camera, um, re-verifying the camera, making sure that the camera team software and the data management software 
results agree, um, we made a whole bunch of JIRA tickets and we're now going to go off and do all of the work. For those of you who don't know, Vincent Rio is the camera project manager. He is both, both awesome and on the way to the airport. Uh, I'm Kevin Real, still the observatory scientist. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the camera has a kind of a major upgrade on one of our refrigeration systems kind of late in the game. We had an agency-led final design review last week. And so this was a working session, taking the recommendations from that review, assigning people to, to take care of the uh, individual problems and uh, getting ready to, um, to get that all in place for uh, camera delivery in six, six, seven, eight months from now. Um, so lots of action there. Thanks. So it's me again for uh, filling in for Josh Bayer, who organized a great session on active optics commissioning. Uh, so we first started with some uh, lesson learns from uh, Aaron on DECAM and Salvatore Savarese on the VST. Uh, so the conclusion of that was to be uh, data driven, uh, to really respond to what we're actually uh, getting instead of uh, what we actually simulate. So we are hoping to spend a lot of time on the telescope to get a lot of data to optimize our active optic system. Um, we also uh, listened to some in-focus uh, science DCD analysis that will also help us uh, optimize our um, um, active optic system. And then we went on a discussions on what are we going to do uh, within Ribbon to commission the active optic system? Which programs do we need to actually conduct? Which ones are actually absolutely needed versus which ones uh, would be to more optimize the system. So we talked about the sensitivity matrix validation, uh, sky scans, uh, meaning that we are going through uh, different elevation in the sky to actually uh, verify our lookup table, uh, verify our co correction as a function of gravity, closed loop validation, and then also look at the giant donuts for those people who actually uh, do wavefront sensing. And you can see a, a picture there. So the outcome of the session is that we're going to probably have a uh, longer workshop and eventually create GIRA tickets, uh, conference pages with all the, uh, the commissioning activities, and then finally the size scripts that we will need during ob observation. Um, that's it. Oh. Great. On Wednesday, there was a photometric redshift session. I didn't share it. Uh, it was chaired by John Franklin Crenshaw and Alex Maltz, but I said I'd speak to their slides. We are starting plans for PhotoZ commissioning. Um, so that was one of the big topics of that session. Another topic was talking about um, making sure that the commissioning, uh, or asking that the commissioning um, fields include a field with good spectroscopic redshift coverage to use for building training sets. Other topics included coordinating with DESI. Um, and then also Alex and John Franklin had organized um, and invited all the science collaborations to come to that session, sort of share their needs for photometric redshifts and to talk about what kinds of photometric redshifts would be best for their science. Um, going, going forward from now and through PhotoZ commissioning, there's a goal to try and sort of unify all of our, our efforts to implement PhotoZ estimators using RAIL, which is a, it's a desk package that um, will work really well for doing PhotoZ uh, validation. In the future, we're also going to be looking for synergies with um, independent sort of compute facilities like the LINK and the LINEA, as well as uh, working with data management team. And the next step is to establish channels to coordinate efforts, which is actually my job. So there's going to be some PhotoZ uh, forums um, coming up, so monthly get-togethers for people working on PhotoZ through the fall where we can um, get started and keep going on this work. Yes, Jen is here. Hi, everyone. I'm speaking on behalf of my fellow session co-organizers, Rachel Street and Alessandro Corsi. We organized a session on um, time domain astronomy and uh, follow-up facilities for that, both in imaging and the oft-ignored field of spectroscopy. So we had a variety of talks, uh, we, um, both from Noir Labs, uh, SALT, South Africa, Taiwan, 
uh, Italy, uh, as well as Australia. Uh, these were um, members of our in-kind programs, and they were talking about the actual facilities they will do for TVS uh, spectroscopic, uh, or TVS both imaging and spectroscopic follow-up. There was also a talk by uh, myself for MSC, uh, focusing on the OIR, X-ray and uh, uh, ultraviolet and optical by, from SWIFT, and radio from uh, Tony Ramajan. And then finally, there was a little bit about um, enabling software from LCO representative uh, Lindstrom. So we had a lot of good uh, points made, a lot of stuff, but unfortunately not much time for discussion, so hopefully that will be our plan for the future. But uh, we really thought about uh, Aon and its flexibility and scheduling and how this indeed is some sort of universal software that we all can start to kind of vet and uh, implement. We talked about um, perhaps uh, really understanding the use cases, scientific use cases for spectroscopic follow-up, especially with regard to TDS. Uh, SWIT was eminently rewriting to support our uh, Ruben TOOs. They had something like a 99% approval rate for all TOs, and they receive on the order of about 1,400 requests. It's, it's quite impressive. And our AO is um, so, uh, also bringing up its uh, TO response program uh, specifically for NGVLA, but they're at least thinking about that stuff right now. And the question is, how do we support and effectively coordinate important spectroscopic and imaging follow-up, as I believe spectroscopy Imaging, complimentary. Thank you. Okay, so Wednesday ended with the unconference, which is an annual tradition for attendee-driven sessions and emergent discussion sessions. So um, if you remember this board that was up out there, everyone suggested things they want to talk about, and then they vote. And then basically the largest rooms um, are assigned to the, the topics with the most votes. And this year we actually have more suggestions than rooms. So I hope some of you who are interested in more of the niche topics manage to find each other near the registration desk and still have a, a conversation. But for the seven that were um, for the seven that were assigned a room, making a, a slide is optional, but I think most of our most of our unconference sessions did um, a, a leader emerged to take notes and make a slide. So we're going to hear from a bunch of them. Oh, and I think a bunch of people went to the pool, which is totally fine. I hope everyone had a good time in their own way. Yeah. Starting with yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sylvia Real. She, her pronouns, and I was working on the LGBTQI plus in Rubin unconference. Um, basically, we saw a need for a sort of similar space for the queer community in LSST Rubin. Um, after having a successful effort of that in the Dark Energy Science Collaboration and hearing people at Rubin say, we want something like this. So we brought a bunch of people together. We've had some pretty stimulating conversation already inside of, you know, that sort of space. Um, some interesting things we can follow up on in some labs in particular. Um, and now we've um, worked to start two spaces on the LSST Slack, one a private space for um, LGBTQI plus members of the community um, that they can just send a message to me to join um, or anyone else who they know who happens to be in the space already. Um, and that's private so that these people can ask um, very sensitive topics or, you know, seek some sort of um, community feedback without needing to worry about outing themselves to the community at large. Um, we also have an LGBTQI plus in uh, and allies in Ruben space, which is just for absolutely everyone. So anyone who wants to be part of these conversations about how we can make a more inclusive environment for Ruben is absolutely welcome to join that, and we'd love to see you. Right. So uh, Lauren emerged as a note taker in the environmental sustainability and Rubin session, and she asked me to speak to the slide that she made. They have a couple of recommendations. Um, so one, the recommendation out of this group discussion was that Rubin take a strong public stance on sustainability and the climate crisis, um, and that Rubin advocate for sustainability um, as the astronomy community advocates for dark skies. So there's kind of a parallel there. The second point is to incorporate the climate crisis into Rubin's educational outreach, um, and, and making the point that as astronomers, we're in a good position to communicate with the public um, because our expertise is sort of immediately relevant, and it's also sort of easy for astronomers to catch and hold the attention of a group, um, and that it's possible to leverage this into discussions about climate change. 
The third recommendation was to reduce conference travel and specifically air travel um, by having more hybrid meetings or more uh, fully virtual meetings and to prioritize in-person conference attendance for scientists in early career stages or people who are on the job market, uh, et cetera. Um, on an administrative slash planning level, the recommendation is to consider carbon budget as well as um, like monetary budget and to uh, tie this into the funding. And then Lauren has provided some further reading uh, for people here. If they're interested in finding out more. There was also an unconference session on data preview zero and Vincenzo had to leave, but I said I would speak to his slide for him. Um, so it is recognized that there are some missing sources uh, in the simulated data set, such as AGN, strong lensing, solar system, and, and young stellar objects. But uh, Vincenzo still finds it's a good opportunity to learn how to handle the Rubin data products through the Rubin, through the Rubin Science Platform and to test the LSSD science pipelines. Um, and even if the science case is different, in many cases, the analysis tools are the same. Uh, he also wanted to point out that it's a big community to work and learn together. We call this community of DP0 participants, we call them delegates, and we have biweekly assemblies where we come together and do tutorials and sort of have breakout sessions where people can hang out and co-work together. And it's been pretty effective in both building a community and having people learn kind of at their own pace. He wants you to know that if you're interested in time domain, you can join the TVS DP0 task force um, by contacting either him or Sara Bonito or looking in the Slack channel TVS-DP0, and that's in the LSSTC Slack space. They have monthly telecons and they're working on their own tutorials and planning to do stuff with DP0 as well. So let's thank Vincenzo for making this slide. Right, so Bryce also asked me to speak to this slide, but Mario, do you want to? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, please come and do it. Uh, all right, uh, I'm, I'm Mario Urich. Um, these are, this slide has been made by Bryce Kalmbach, who uh, served as our note taker at the Moving Objects on Conference. So there, uh, we, we mostly spend a lot of our time discussing Kuiper Belt objects with LSST, um, how long it will take to, to get good orbits. Um, we've, we've talked about how, what are DM's plans to, to, to find it with our um, solar system pipeline and in general to what, to what ranges can we expect to, to discover um, um, Kuiper Belt objects without um, having to have specific s uh, software. Um, also talked about possibilities for using visual tracking methods uh, to find even fainter objects. This is something that Ruben will not do as a, as a matter of course, but this is something that the scientific community is really interested in and could be one of the larger reprocessings of Ruben data uh, down the road. Um, finally, we, we talked about one emerging issue, which is any follow-up. Uh, as we're getting closer to the end of, of Ruben construction, we understand just how much data is going to come off of Ruben. We're also realizing that even with our self-follow-up capability, where Ruben follows up most of its own discoveries, those that we do not follow up would overwhelm the, the worldwide follow-up system. So this is something that uh, we're going to actively engage on with, uh, with the NEO community, both here in the U.S. and in Europe, to, to try to come up with some plan how to handle that when we turn on in about two years. Thank Hi, I'm Gautam Narayan. I'm the uh, Desk Deputy Analysis Coordinator. So Ruben's uh, baseline plan includes yearly co-ads, but it doesn't include nightly co-ads, uh, particularly the deep drilling fields. Uh, and there is a lot to be gained. In fact, there is a median of something like 20 images taken every night in every filter for the deep drilling fields. So if you could co-ad them, you will go deeper, you will get better distances for supernovae, you will find more strongly lens sources, and more excitingly, you will find more things that you just haven't seen before things that we are completely not expected. When we started simulating this in desk, we found a 20% increase in the dark energy figure of merit, mostly from more tight constraints on WA, for more precise distances. So we really wanted to make sure that this is uh, now part of our uh, regular operations processing. The DPDD actually considers this, uh, but hasn't actually made a requirement on it. Now, we're really mindful that the DM team is overloaded with a lot of stuff and we want to help out as much as we can. So DESK will start to prototype this pipe task. 
we have as part of desk bob armstrong who was a member of the dm team and is a uh, gen3 butler guru and so he will uh, develop this pipe task and we will work closely with dm to try to integrate it into our regular processing pipeline there are still some questions uh, particularly about how to get alerts out from these coads but we think a lot of this is tractable and solvable with the existing infrastructure we are not worried about the 60 second latency for these uh, coaded images uh, it's certainly an open question as to whether you want the coads to be taken, the images that go into the coads to be taken back to back to back, which will uh, increase efficiency by reducing slewing, or whether you want to space them out, which gives you more time periods to find increasing things. Uh, but we think we can solve that in the couple of years we have before operations start and hopefully enable a lot more new science. Thank you. I don't actually know who made the slide, but uh, somebody wrote down the job description of Keith Bechtel, uh, uh, Robert, and myself on the board, and a bunch of people put check marks beside it. So we attended, um, and this session turned out to be uh, primarily a discussion of where people want us to point the telescope during commissioning. Uh, and we reminded people that we had a call for all the science collaborations to submit proposed fields versus time versus the season, essentially, for the commissioning period. Um, but we had a good chat about, um, about uh, different ideas there. And then um, at the end, we actually, uh, Lynn Jones was there. And uh, survey strategies for the entire survey have been simulated, but there were certainly some calls for simulated surveys for the first year, again, just to try to optimize science during that first year. So that's how this, that's how this uh, session went. Hi, I'm David Buckley, representing uh, South African in-kind uh, contribu contribution in terms of uh, follow-up. And so this was a, uh, a movie night uh, without popcorn, uh, and it was uh, basically showing uh, a new uh, outreach video uh, called New Discoveries Through Intelligent Observations at the South African Astronomical Observatory. And it was talking about the whole need for coordination of follow-up with a particular emphasis on that amazing event, GW170817, where South Africa uh, was one of the first facilities to get spectroscopic coverage of that. Um, so the, the, the video covers that event, it covers gravitational wave astronomy in general, uh, and the importance of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in the future when we have this deluge of uh, of events um, and alerts that we have to follow up. A and in particularly the, the, the big uh, data deluge from big data product, um, big data producers like Rubin and SKA. We also in the video discuss some synergies in other sciences uh, and it was sort of quite timely that at the time the video was being made, we were in a, a lockdown um, so it was a challenge to make this video, but we also talked about the uh, early epidemiology research of COVID-19 and the sort of synergies between the sort of work that intelligent observatories have to do and what other sciences have to do. So I would urge you to, uh, to have a look at that video um, and see what you think. Refresh, oh, I'll let you do it. Pictures. You're good to go. So I'm Andy Connolly, um, and with Rachel Mandelbaum at Carnegie Mellon, I am the co-PI of the Link uh, Frameworks Initiative. Um, the session Data Software to Science continued on from a really fabulous meeting that was held at the CCA in March, where we brought together about 50 people to discuss early science cases that can be done with Rubin Data, and in particular those cases that needed software or computational development in order for them to really achieve their goals. Um, there's a 
250-page report from that meeting that's available on the archive up there, um, on the link uh, to the archive up there. You only have to read the first 15 pages. I'd encourage you to read it. And if you have any comments or thoughts on it, we'd, be, um, we'd really like to hear it. So this session followed on from that and focused on time series data. And in particular, what we were interested in were what tools and algorithms were being developed to support the analysis of light curves. So we heard some really nice talks from the Rubin Science Platform team about the tools that are available and how you might actually access time series data. We identified some areas, whether it was software that needed um, um, accelerating to work at the scale of the Rubin data, or whether it was uh, functionality in the Rubin Science Platform that was needed by the, different, by the community to support um, time series analysis. Um, we heard about some possible uh, approaches that we might take to address some of these, uh, this missing development. Um, and uh, we described or we talked about the fact that there were uh, software engineers available through the Link Frameworks Initiative that might be able to help with some of this. The takeaways from the meeting for us were, um, one, that we should create a venue where data management, where Link, where the science collaborations, and in particular the contributions from the international um, uh, partners can come together and discuss what they're developing in terms of software so that we can have a more coherent approach to building the tools that we need for early Rubin science. And then something else that we heard during the meeting, we heard multiple times throughout the whole of the PCW, is that there is a desire for more software development training for their science collaborations. And so we're gonna be looking at both of those and over the next um, few weeks, we hope to be able to make contributions to ideas for how we might address both of those two points. Thank you. Hi. Uh, while I may look like Fred Molkamp, I'm actually, for the next minute, going to be Sophie Reed. So you can imagine me as shorter, blonder, and more British. Uh, so uh, in the source injection um, pipeline session, uh, it was mostly presented by uh, Sophie Reed, Lee Kelvin, and Josh Myers on their work on a pipeline to inject fake sources, well, sorry, synthetic sources into, uh, into images. And so there's a discussion on how to create the catalogs, how to um, inject your own sources, whatever kind of sources you may be, so that if, for example, DP0 or DP0.2 doesn't have the types of objects you want, you can inject the objects that you want. Um, and so there was some discussion on um, potentially adding variance planes to, to help out with that. And I think that was, that was about it. Greetings again. Um, on Thursday, we had three sessions in a row that were a little bit camera centric. Um, the first one was both my favorite and least favorite, the entire conference in that we discussed the uh, arrival and reassembly of the camera on the summit and discussed all of the, uh, the vast amount of work required to uh, be ready for that in uh, next, next Northern Spring. Um, we detailed it a, lot, a lot of the planning that has to happen, who was going to do it, and then at the very end, we did discuss um, a current schedule conflict of the handling and coding of M1, M3, which is not small, and the arrival of the camera simultaneously and how that doesn't work. Um, our funding agencies had hung up before we mentioned the word three-month potential delay, but uh, we, uh, we needed to discuss that. Um, the second session that we had was... Um, essentially a, a talk through of what it looks like if we need to take the camera off the telescope in operations and then do some, uh, do some maintenance on the camera or because we have to take the camera off the telescope to recode M2, um, what, what is the time frame involved? And it turns out to be something like uh, two calendar months um, plus the maintenance time. So uh, it, in the case of M2, you know, a couple of weeks at least to recode and then put everything back together. So not a small impact on operations, but it was a number that operations probably wanted to know. And then in the third uh, session that we had, it was a camera re-verification on the summit. Um, and we spent an awful lot of time actually talking about the final verification of the camera at Slack, and then 
the subset of the tests that are done at Slack before shipping that will be repeated on the mountain. Uh, Andy Rasmussen, the camera scientist, spent a lot of time going through the both proposed uh, data taking as well as some results from prior data taking on the verification of the camera. So those were the three camera centric uh, sessions for that day. So I'm, I'm Julien Guy from Berkeley Lab. So we had a session about synergies with the dark energy spectroscopic instrument. So DAISY uh, is a massive spectroscopic survey that is in operation today. Uh, we have already more than 14 million extragalactic redshifts, uh, 4 million stars. So we need to, and um, we will have a second version of our survey, DAISY 2, that will operate starting in 2026. A lot of overlap with the LSST in time. So now we have to think about the overlap in terms of footprint because there's a ton of science we can do with both surveys. So we discussed all of that. I invite you to look at the slides uh, on this session. Uh, so it would be beneficial for dark energy, for BAO, galaxy, galaxy lensing, photo Z, intrinsic alignment, supernovae, dark matter with strong lenses, radial velocities of stars in Milky Way, local dwarf galaxies, stellar streams variable stars, transients, and optical counterparts of gravitational wave events. So, yeah, uh, I hope we had good discussions during this meeting, and I hope we will have more discussions in the coming months uh, and uh, looking into the detail about all of that. Hi, I'm Ernest Harold. I'm going to be speaking about two different sessions that we had back to back yesterday. This uh, workshop that we had involved not only people here at the PCW, but we also invited some local area teachers uh, to join us. So it was oriented both for the people here to learn more about our education program, but also specifically for the teachers to think about how to implement our first investigation, which will be publicly released at the beginning of October called exploring the solar, or surveying the solar system. So in session one, what we did is we gave a brief overview of the formal education program as it stands now. And we talked about uh, the investigation itself wrapped with all the support instructional components and uh, how a little bit about its implementation. We also talked about the fact that we started in July, our professional development, and two communities of practice, one on Facebook and one email discussion, and invited people to join those. We had a lot of time in session one to explore all of these components on the new website that Lauren uh, showed everyone yesterday in the plenary. So people could go, at the webs go to the website and look at different aspects of what interested them the most, and then we concluded with a discussion. Part two yesterday, was really focused on going through the entire investigation as quickly as we could. Uh, these investigations are designed for longer than a 90 minute time slot. So we abbreviated it a little bit, but what we did is we had uh, people working together in small groups. I was delighted to see that we had some project scientists there who worked with the teachers and seemed to be just as engaged as the teachers were in our, our products. We had some helpful discussion about implementation in the classroom and some discussion about types of assessment uh, strategies that could be used. Uh, at the end, uh, we asked for uh, people to give us feedback specifically through a special uh, Google form that we created so that we could get some feedback on tweaking and refining our investigations. I am happy to report that looking at the results afterwards, we had 100% total customer satisfaction, although we had some helpful feedback. Uh, in general, teachers were like, right on, you did exactly what we need, thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, so uh, the, LSST data set, of course, will be transformative for, for astronomy. It's also going to be accompanied by 
uh, really an unprecedented access um, and level of computing resources available to process that data. Um, uh, much of it, of course, uh, uh, offered through uh, the data facilities um, themselves. But as part of the international in-kind program, we're also going to have access to roughly a dozen independent data access centers and scientific processing centers. Um, and which will expand the computational software data and also human um, uh, expertise that will be available to the Rubin community. Um, but we can't think of these as just simply alternate access uh, portals to the Rubin data. Um, it's really critical that we understand the use cases um, uh, for these, these IDACs and SPCs um, in order to make the most efficient use of them. Um, so uh, uh, we are beginning that process. Um, we uh, participated in the, in the Link Frameworks workshop, which, which Andy reported on, which is an excellent starting point. And we're looking for to work with the community to develop more of these use cases specific to the IDEX. Um, the IDEX themselves are also thinking about use cases and making development plans. But we know we, we need to continue this discussion. Um, we're going to be organizing a virtual workshop, and thanks to the Link Kickstarter program for en enabling that. Um, so be on the lookout for more ways to participate in this effort. So it's me again, but this time I'm channeling Eli Rykoff. Um, so Eli, uh, Eli ha held a session on Thursday around the topic of bootstrapping photometric calibration uh, from the first day of commissioning and through year one. The goal being to get rapid approximate photometric calibrations early on in the survey so we can uh, calibrate the images. Um, U-band is particularly challenging. There was a lot of discussion around how we were going to do this. Um, the conclusion, one of the, well, one of the, the conclusions out of this was that uh, we would create this, what was termed a Frankenstein's monster of a reference catalog um, from many other catalogs through which we would uh, synthesize LSST passbands and use this to bootstrap photometric calibration in the early parts of the, during commissioning in the early parts of the survey, and that this is something that over time could be uh, improved. Um, it's also known as Rykoff's monster. Uh, we will uh, be cal carrying out this effort um, through the, um, the photometric uh, calibration commissioning unit. This is one of the science units that was mentioned before as part of Keith's commissioning effort. Uh, and that will also include uh, in-kind contributions to this effort. Thank you. Hi, Will Clarkson, speaking on behalf of Fed Bianco, who was the driving force behind this session. Uh, Fed assembled the panelists, chaired the meeting, and indeed uh, wrote this slide. Uh, so this was a panel discussion, um, the idea being to get uh, a non-exhaustive set of the many groups who are doing DEI efforts in various different um, pieces of the Rubin uh, community to uh, make people aware of what it is they're actually doing, um, prompted by these discussion prompts here on their focus, their their goals and indeed their sphere of influences. Um, these are very important, very complicated uh, problems and it's, I think it's impossible for me to summarize in one uh, pithy uh, attendance right now. Um, but the discussion was very productive and particularly from the audience who raised uh, many issues uh, that, that, to add to the discussion. Um, part of the point of this is also to get the groups to work, to talk to each other I think that was very successful. And um, I think I'll finish just by thanking again the panelists and the, uh, the audience members. So thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Markheim, uh, new on the in-kind program uh, team, giving this for Apergita. Um, so we had a community session for the in-kind programs. Well, we really talked about a lot of the wide-ranging resources and facilities that are being made available to the operations and science community. Uh, we had a special section on that that talked about the availability of open telescope time on one to 10 meter class telescopes that's gonna be available and managed through the NORLAB time allocation system. It was a very engaging and interesting conversation. 
Um, we also talked about the data rights agreements and how those are being uh, moving forward and hopefully getting signed soon so that we can even work more together. Um, and really talked about how some of the contributions had started and are moving forward and we're gonna be going through our first annual evaluation progress very soon. And then I'd just like to say that we're always in, looking forward to engaging with the community, whether as recipients, or contributors, or just general members. Uh, we have a help desk that you can email. You can read lots of our facts. And of course, you can even book office hours one-on-one -on -one with any of us. Thank you. Hi, I'm James Buchanan. I'm the 15th president of the United States, and I led the uh, deblending session on Thursday. We talked about um, basically how what blending is exactly, how prevalent is it, what are we doing about it. Um, we started off by hearing about um, how unrecognized blends are going to be degrading our cosmic shear inference, and my takeaway was that this is a problem. Uh, we should be concerned about this and continuing to study ways of handling it. Luckily, we have a lot of people doing exactly that. Um, we have uh, Scarlet Lights up in the in the DM stack. It's a very highly optimized version of Scarlet for LSST specifically. For those who don't know, this is our uh, deep blender that we're using now. Um, we also saw that we're well underway for new interesting methods of measuring galaxy properties. We heard about multi-profit and uh, how it reacts to blends. And there is a uh, growing community of people developing and using the Blending Toolkit software framework for simulating blends and uh, evaluating uh, de-blending methods. We heard uh, about a lot of people who are uh, working on that and using that for their science cases. Put links to as many of those things as I can there. I'd also like to echo the call that I gave at that session that if anyone's working on blending related studies, how it affects your science, if you're coming up with fancy new deep blenders, uh, please get in touch with the blending work, working group and the Dark Energy Science Collaboration. I'm the co-convener of that group along with Cyril Dew and we want to hear about what everyone's doing. Um, thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Jones McKean. I'm um, the uh, the Vera C. Rubin artist in residence, and um, we had a really interesting session. Actually, it was pretty um, different. I think where we pulled back from a lot of the granularity in some of the other sessions and really looked at Rubin as an object that connects to a much larger continuum of aspirational objects that humans have made, but began a process of trying to think about what what Rubin is in a more cultural sense. Uh, it was quite fascinating, the conversation that ensued. And um, we also talked, um, really introduced the idea of what the artist in residence could be, what it could do. So we thought about some different roles and the ways in which the um, I can help benefit the community in different in different ways. So um, sort of offer that as a challenge and to think about different programming and different initiatives that um, the artists in residence can support, um, but also thinking about bridges. Um, so, so away from Ruben and the research, but also to Ruben from outside communities. So feel free to, um, to reach out to me. I'm happy to, um, to engage. I would love to engage with you all more deeply. So thank you. Oh, I'm gonna count to 15 and you can all read this slide. Friday's speakers, please.
Hi, I'm Matt Holman. I'm the chair of the user committee. We've um, you, the Ruben users committee is charged with uh, soliciting feedback from the users, so you, um, and um, providing recommendations for improvements in um, reports from our our twice yearly meetings. Uh, we had our our first meeting this morning. That first meeting at, uh, that was open to the public. Uh, many of you attended, and and I I thought it worked very well. Of getting some of your feedback. Um, Fortunately, uh, half a dozen of our members were able to attend in person. Uh, there's uh, you know, up here. There's the the website that includes not only our the charge, but our previous uh, meeting minutes and our our report. Uh, you can also email us directly. I want to um, encourage you to do so. Uh, this is still a, a relatively new committee, so we haven't you know exercised all all of the channels, uh, but we will. Uh, I want to extend a special thanks to, to Melissa and to the members of, of the CET, and also to thank those of you who have already given us feedback. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, my name is Holger Dras. I am a systems engineer and based in Chile. And in our session, we had a really exciting moment. We wrote out the new maintenance management system. So <clears throat> it's maybe a bit unnoticed, but that's a system that will take care on the observatory for the next 15 years, where we will put in all our information that we are gathering now and where we will have all our maintenance procedures and all the information on what's the uh, observatory actually consisting of stored and uh, we will do periodic maintenance. We will have preventive maintenance routines over there. When something breaks, we can also go there and pick up information on what has happened to the part, how to fix it. So this actually concludes a long period. Two years we were working on this. We had a working group with uh, members from all over the team. Um, Today we had an, a session with Jeff Barr here together and he actually prepared the, prepared the slide and I'm presenting it now. So we had, we had a team effort in white, over wide parts of the projects and we ended up with a number of requirements that, that we passed through a number of vendors and we identified the best one for our purposes. And we got actually a product, it's called Open Mained from the company Technoteca. Alberto, who's our primary contact person, did a great job in, in presenting it today. You can see here a nice picture of the observatory where we can later on click, just click on certain parts and can get information and know what we have to do when, when something has to be done. So um, it was a really good moment. We had really active discussions. On the other hand, it's just the starting point, so we, we will go on, we will work with a community of, at the summit especially and everybody who wants to know more about the system is very welcome to contact me and I will I'm happy to give details on everything of the system. Hi, <clears throat> hello everybody. I'm David Jimenez, an electronic engineer from uh, Ruin Observatory based on in Chile. And I wanted to bring up to you, to the, this PCBW, uh, engineering or technical session about the Dynalim system. The Dynalim system is going to be in charge to dissipate all the, the heat dissipation of the both cameras and uh, all the components that are located at the teleco telescope and assembly. So the idea was, well, the covered top points in these sessions was just uh, to try to answer different questions such as the what, why, and how is this system, and having some uh, uh, ideas about the, the, the rationality or the, the motivation that have been the, the reason for developing this, this system. So we uh, performed a walkthrough during the design process from the paper on the design up to the uh, assembly and integration that is going, is going performing during these uh, weeks and during this last year. 
And the last point was just to conclude with the next steps and the, um, the final startup of this system. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sierra again. Uh, I'm not Jim. Um, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, so we had a panel for early career astronomers on networking to, in tools in the job application process with an eye to how things have changed considerably during the pandemic. Um, we had a very active conversation. I think a couple of the big takeaways were how important the mentoring process is, especially for marginalized folks in academia as well as how difficult and important the networking thing um, aspects are and how much of that comes to chance. So we had a lot of discussions about how we can improve the process and a lot of interesting thoughts to take forward. And hopefully some of it will materialize into good resources for um, all of the astronomers who are yet to come. Um, and I think another important aspect that we did um, talk about is how um, part of this is needing to not focus so much on only the academic track as the goal for all people in academia, but also talk more about tracks in industry and talks um, in infrastructure and academia adjacent tracks. Here, okay, we'll just read Frosty's slide for 15 no, seconds. <clears throat> Frosty's asked me to cover for her there, if uh, you can hear me. Am I audible? I guess not. I am audible? Okay. I, oh, good. Okay. So um, uh, there was this, uh, a session um, where uh, members of the conference could speak with the developers of the science platform. Um, I wasn't at the session. Um, Frosty chaired this. Um, but she's uh, not available right now. So uh, let's there. have a round of applause for Frosty for doing that session today. Okay. Actually, two more, two more things to say. <laughs> yeah. One is that we had a lot of posters this year. We had about uh, almost 40 students come through the LSSTC Enabling Science Initiative, and we also had about 20 just openly contributed posters. And so the students we've had before, but um, I think three years ago when we tried to offer a contributed poster session, we had almost no takers. And so to have 20 this year just contributed posters, people have been doing Rubin related research, that's a really good sign uh, that, that the science uh, community is growing. So I just want to do a round of applause for everyone who prepared a poster and brought it here. And And the other thing is that chairing a session at the PCW is actually a lot of work. You're probably the one who came up with the idea. You're the one who arranged for all of the speakers. You arranged for your virtual participants to be able to hear you. You arranged for note takers, moderators. You did it all. You created the agenda and then you ran the whole session here as well. And so we know it's a really big job to chair a session. And so I just wanted to personally thank every session chair for doing all that work. Thanks. All right, with all that exciting stuff, I feel it compelled to remind you that I'm Victor Kravendam. I am the Rubin Construction Project Manager. And on behalf of Jelko, the Director for Rubin Construction, Bob, the Director for Rubin Operations, thanks to all of you for participating and making this a really successful week. In particular, um, I think we've mentioned a couple of times that the, uh, the interest was overwhelming. And I just wanted to send out special thanks to representatives from our funding agencies that were here, the Rubin Construction and Rubin Operations staff that came from across the globe to be here with us. We had members and staff and uh, membership from LSST Corporation that was here, um, had science collaboration members, committee members um, across the board that were here helping to make this a, a successful week. Also had a new in-kind, 
participants, uh, people that are helping with commissioning um, or with the operations in kind program. Uh, members from other projects from across the globe that that were here uh, that all make this uh, an interesting and engaging week. Uh, and then finally, just the general community. We had members from the community that were just here interested. Uh, you heard from artists as well, uh, some teachers, some local teachers. So uh, really, that, that that I probably didn't even capture everybody, but really extend our thanks uh, for for being here because it's actually your participation. Uh, that is what makes this uh, this week a success. Um, and then, of course, I should not last but not least is everybody that was online participating, and you see them uh, sort of pictured at the bottom. A few of them, at least, that submitted some some photos. You see them um, identified at the bottom. So um, I think Usra made some mention of some of the work that was going on this week with um, the change over the data facility. Kevin uh, gave you a preview of some work that's going on the site. Uh, this week, um, while we were here making a different kind of progress, I really wanted to extend some thanks to others that were not able to make it, that were also making progress uh, in, in other ways. And, and just to add to the pictures that Kevin showed, here's uh, yet an image of the site today, weather looking much nicer than in the past month. Um, and this is a different image in a different angle of what uh, Kevin showed, which is the integrating structure for the top end of the telescope carrying the camera mass simulator and its new volume simulation, uh, which is that extended framework. Uh, all of that moved up to the eighth level today. And taking advantage of the beautiful weather, you see some people working on the louver system on the outside of the dome. And earlier this week, we reinstalled the uh, secondary mirror mass simulator with its new volume simulation added, added features. So there's uh, been a lot of work going on both here uh, and across the board, and we really want to extend uh, thanks to those people that uh, that continue to do their day jobs. So, um, I mentioned this, I think, yesterday, or was it the day before? It all blends together, but there is an exit survey coming to you, if it hasn't already, and we really encourage you all to fill it in, give us some feedback. Normally, at this, um, at, at this session, we would give you the dates for next year. We'd give you maybe some venue information. Uh, but all of that is pending uh, feedback and some, uh, some further discussion about what's the right format uh, for how to continue this. And so your feedback is really uh, very much appreciated. And so please do get that. And if you can get it to us by next week, that would be um, even better because this takes uh, a lot of planning and a lot of time to make it, it work out right. So I um, wanted at this point, once again, extend thanks to the organizing committees. Um, it takes a lot of work to take in all of the ideas, process that all, and turn that into the agenda that you see that you participated in this week. Uh, Melissa's extended the thanks to the actual people that ran those sessions, but it takes a lot of work to prep for that. Uh, and I wanted to extend the thanks to the organizing committee um, and I also wanted to bring out especially the organizing committee as well, the local organizing committee, uh, not just for the massive amount of work that they did uh, preparing for this, but also in executing. And so there's a, there's a ton of work that goes on all week long to keep everything going successfully. Uh, and that is the IT group that you see running around making it all work, uh, Ian and David, in particular running up and down here trying to keep everything going. The administration team um, that runs the front desk, uh, the administration desk, uh, and all the other behind the scenes work that's happening there uh, by people from our admins from the north, from the south, from Slack, and various other members that, that, that help make all that work. And so my special thanks to them. And then uh, up front here, Rampal and Melissa, who have been diligently making sure that everything goes successfully, and I really extend personal thanks to both of you for all of that extra work. Schedule is always my fault, and so uh, we're about finished. Um, lunches. Lunches are outside in the this breezeway, the coffee area. So please make sure you grab a lunch on your way out, finish up the day. I just want to tell you that some of the rooms that we've been using are still ours for the day. There's just going to be no uh, IT support in there, no equipment 
uh, and nobody around to help you, but those rooms are still available if you're still here and want to congregate and make some further progress. Um, and then with that, I once again extend thanks to everybody for being here, and um, we see you again on the next time. And thanks, Emily, for all the photography.